we will always become like the object which we worship. Bible is kindly pleased to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, and I want to talk about tearing down idols this morning. There's a beautiful poem that I read recently, and it goes like this, Lord, take away my idols carved deep within my soul, the ones made out of greed that makes me lose control, the ones that fill my heart, that take me away from you, idols in my daily life that, that keep me from what is true, idols of my dreams that haunt my waking hours, idols of my faith that take away your power. The ones I've put before you, the ones I choose to follow, idols of my mind and thoughts that leave me void and leave my heart hollow, idols of this day and age that creep into my path, idols of my deepest thoughts so as to keep me from your wrath. There's idols that I hide in the closets of my life for no man to see, idols from the past that bring me nothing but grief and strife. I have idols that I adorn in the outer part of me, the ones that keep me from getting down on bended knee. Lord, take away my idols. I leave them at the door. For you alone are worthy and the one I choose to adore. Lord, take away the idols. I need to worship you. I surrender every idol. And fill me with more of you. Believe it or not, the most common warning mentioned the most in the Bible in sin is not dealing with lying gossiping, adultery, or murder. The most common sin in all of Scripture, the most common sin mentioned in the 66 books of this Bible is the sin of idolatry. In fact, 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 21 says, read it with me, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Now, idolatry is not just a pagan issue. It's not just an Old Testament issue. It's a human issue. It's not just a 12-inch tall piece of wood or clay or stone or cement that we bow to, touch, and worship. Look up here. When it comes to idolatry, the danger is not the item of stone or clay or wood, but rather the idols that are within our heart. There are some folks listening to me that as much as they want the power and presence of God, they will never experience its fullness. Because the God of this world and all of its affections have become the God of your, your, your object of your worship. Some of the most beautiful people listening to me right now, listening to you right now, are probably bound with some of the deepest, deepest idols in their life. The question might actually be harder to answer than you think as to whether or not any of you are holding on to idols. Look up here. This is very, very important. Satan will try every thing he's got with every trick he has up his sleeve to keep you from worshiping God. He hates God. In fact, his primary function before he came to earth was God's worship leader. He knows what worship is. He was in charge of it. 
his function was primarily worship. To such a point, to such an extent, that the musical instruments were built into Satan. And where Satan walked in the presence of God, the flow and movement of heaven would flow through Satan or Lucifer. And everywhere Lucifer went, heaven was filled with worship. Satan invented it. Satan will try to keep you from worshiping God by deceiving us into worshiping man-made images that get into your heart. No matter how sacred they may be. John Calvin said this, Man's mind is like a store of idolatry and superstition. So much that if a man believes his own mind, it is certain he will forsake God and forge some other idol in his own brain. Are you sure you're awake? Are you sure you're awake? Idols, you may ask. Who? Me? Do you have idols in your life? <laughs> Well, you'd say, I, I never worship a physical object as a god, you may declare. But there are, there are idols in your life today that need to go in Jesus' name. So do me a flavor and put your hands to heaven and say, Holy Spirit, search me and know me and expose the false gods of my heart. I freely surrender them to you. Holy Spirit, do your perfect work and clean me out. Clean me out. We think of idolatry as something done by ignorant, ancient people who prostrated themselves before some dumb carved image of wood or stone, supposedly a deity. And for 20 years of my life, I did exactly that. For 20 long years of my life, I worshiped a carved stone image. Certainly, that would be considered to be idolatry. And still inside of me, I can remember the feeling that I had inside of me. A gentleman named Tim Keller wrote this from his book called Counterfeit Gods. An idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give. Or anything that seeks to give what only God can give. An idol is whatever you look at and say, please pay attention to me. An idol is whatsoever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I will feel my life has meaning. Then I will know that I have value. Then I will know that I am safe. Then I will know that I am significant. And if I have this thing, then I will know that I am secure. An idol is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose this idol, your life would hardly feel worth living. Every one of us. Every one of us has idols. I want to share with you a story. Truly, in the Bible, I've read this story hundreds of times. 
And every time I read this story, it reminds me, not one of us is safe, oh, not one, from the hidden idols of our heart. In this church that you're sitting in here right now, only 30% of the church supports the church. The other 70% of the people that call this church home do not support this church financially. And for the 30% that belong to this church and call this church home, the reason why they support the church is because money is not their idol. Thirty percent of everyone that walks in that door has placed God before money. And the other 70 percent feel it'd be too much of a risk to give what God requires because money has become your idol. Now for some, money may not be your idol. And for the 30% that give, and they give generously, there's still idols lurking, and the Holy Spirit knows, and He knows how to find them, and He knows how to track them down, church. And you gotta let Him track them down, and you gotta let Him destroy them, and you gotta be honest with Him about it. You know, all these years you've been able to hide the idols of your life from your mommy and from your daddy, and you think from your pastor. But I want you to look up here, and I wanna tell you something. If you want to become more like Jesus Christ, worship Him. Amen. I love people saying, oh, I love Jesus and I worship Jesus. And they live like hell. Look up here. I want to share with you a very simple but powerful truth. It doesn't matter what you say you are. It doesn't matter who you think you are. It doesn't matter who you think you want people to think you are. It matters. It matters whether or not people can see Jesus in you. And if people cannot see Jesus in you, there, my friend, is your idol. We become like the object for which we worship. Pay attention to that. We will always become like the object by which we worship. Drug addicts worship drugs. Sex addicts worship sex. Your life is in turmoil. Angry, hateful, resentful, argumentative. That's because that's the God that you worship. Nothing more, nothing less. The Bible tells us of a very religious young man. Went to church, the synagogue, very popular, very wealthy. And the Bible tells us of this wealthy young man that came to Jesus and got on his knees with the pebbles biting into his kneecaps. And with a genuine concern about his salvation, he asked Jesus one of the most important questions that a man could ever ask. He thought he had it made. He was wealthy. He attended church faithfully. Considered to be a very prominent resident of the community. But Jesus found his idol. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 16. Are you sure you're awake out here? Are you all awake in YouTube land as well? Amen. And behold, one came and said unto him. This is the religious guy. Good master. Remember, he had all the right words. A religious guy. Good master. 
What good thing shall I do to have eternal life? Verse 17, and he, Jesus, said unto him, Why calleth me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, eternal life, what does it say? Keep, Keep the commandments. This kid has no idea the grenade that's about to be dropped in front of him. <laughs> Just like you. Now the Lord begins to list the commandments that will keep him secure. Jesus said, come on, thou shall not murder. That's a good one. Thou shall not commit adultery. That's another good one. This will keep you safe, right? Thou shall not steal. Anybody disagree with that? That's a good one. Thou shall not bear false witness. No gossiping. That's another good one. That'll keep you safe. Verse 19. Honor thy father and thy mother. That's a good one. And thou shall love thy neighbor as thyself. Interesting, he only lists five of the Ten Commandments. Are you awake? Yes, he only lists five of the Ten Commandments. But the last one here, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is not one of the Ten Commandments. But from the book of Leviticus, which contains another 640 two additional laws that man must keep in order to inherit eternal life. Now by this time, this young rich ruler is pretty feeling pretty good about himself, wouldn't you say? He's probably never stole, at least told nobody that he did, or at least never got caught stealing. He claims he never bore false witness, at least he claims so. Verse 20, the young man said to him, come on, read this with me. Here's what the young man said. All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I lack? <laughs> Here comes the grenade. The king of kings and the lord of lords, the one who can see, the one who is omnipotent, the one who knows your every thought, knows your every move, knows your waking hours, the things you do behind closed doors, the things you do in darkness, discovers what his idol truly is. What do you say to somebody when, who thinks they're so good and so perfect because they keep all the commandments flawlessly? Did you used to think like that? <laughs> Hello, did you used to think like that? Three of you did? Well, let me join you. I thought I was the goody two-shoes of goody two-shoes. Up until the time that I got saved, I thought I was God's gift to the world, spiritually. I never stole, I never drank, I never even swore a word out of my mouth. Not one swear. Never drank, never smoked, never murdered, never lusted. Well, that's a white lie. No. <laughs> I thought I was good. If anyone was going to make it to heaven, it was Mike DeRoche. And by the way, I never hesitated to tell you either. But then along comes the Holy Spirit and saves my wretched soul. See, this young man said exactly what Mike DeRoche said. I I've never murdered, Lord. I I I've never committed adultery. I I've never stolen. I've never bore false witness. I've, I I've always honored my mama and my daddy. And I've loved 
thy neighbor as myself. But what do I lack? Jesus Christ looks at him. Stares at him. He looks up to the blue sky and to the surrounding hills and pulls out a grenade out of his pocket. <laughs> and this man's life was forever changed when he said this. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, now perfect, Come on. If thou will be perfect, go and sell. I'm going to throw idol in there. Go sell your idols. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And thou shall have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. <laughs> Jesus discerned what his idol was. If his idols was drug addiction, here's what he would have said. He would have said, go and flush down the toilet all the drugs that you have. Give them away. Throw them away. If pornography was your, his idol, he would have said to the rich young ruler, go take all of the pornographic magazines and burn them. <laughs> if his idol was alcohol, he would have known it. He would have said, go and find all the alcohol that you have hidden under the bed. Go find it all and smash the bottles and pour it on the ground. But it wasn't any of those things. His idol was money. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not like to hear this, but I am so grateful, Father, to be able to tell your people that we all need freedom in Jesus' mighty name. And every single idol, every secret idol, Everyone that is hidden, everyone that lies dormant and secret is going to be crushed today in the name of Jesus. Because the truth will set you free. An idol is anything so central in your life that should you lose it, you freak out. How about television? How about television? Turn off your cable for one month. Tell me if that's not an idol. How about your cell phone? Hello, are you awake? How about your cell phone? Verse 22. When the young man had heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This is so important. Let's look up here. This man walked away from God without the gift of eternal life. Instead, he chose his possessions. This perfect man. And this is Mike DeRoche's own personal belief about this. This is really key to me. If God had said, Jesus has said, go sell everything you own. And the young boy said, yes, Lord, I will do so. If it was written differently in scripture, where you saw the young man say, yes, Lord, I will go now and sell everything I own. That boy would have gotten only two steps down the sidewalk. He would have walked away from Christ just two steps. And the Lord would have said, son, come back here. I just wanted to make sure that your heart was in the right place. Listen to me. This is the Mike DeRoche theory of this. 
But I have known him to do this in my life every step of the way. Just give it to me, son. And just the simple act of surrendering everything to him. God will not only give you what you did not ask for. It will give you everything else as a bonus. So this boy's heart was what? This boy's heart was what? Divided. We all come to God with a divided heart, don't we? You know the most liberating thing in the world? Maybe you haven't gotten there yet. Maybe you're just still hanging on to a little bit of how good you are. Let me just explain something to you. There's nothing good in you. Now, now listen, look, 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 look up here. I, I know psychologists and some preachers want you to think that you're great and you're wonderful and you're all these things. And I, I get it. It helps, it helps sell good books. Amen. I, and I understand that. But there is nothing good in you. There is nothing good in you. You are rotten to the core. God will not accept a divided heart. He must be absolute monarch. There is not a room in your heart for two thrones. Are you sure you're awake? Please listen to me. You are bound by drugs. And you're sharing that throne with God. But God is not part. He's not in that room. There is not room in your heart for two thrones. I don't care if it's drugs or your wife or your children. Christ said, No man shall serve God and mammon. You cannot mix the worship of God with the worship of anything else. There is not room for any other throne in your heart if Christ is there. If worldliness shall come in, godliness will go out. Please look up here, look up here. When worldliness comes in, godliness goes out. When God comes in, the world goes out. Do I need to repeat myself? Maybe I should. Is that too complicated? When the world comes in, God goes out. When God comes in, the world goes out. He will not share the throne. Are you sure you're awake? Anybody in here want to confess that they may have at least one little tiny idol in their life? Can I hear an amen? Good. Don't be embarrassed. Even Inez has some. Amen? Right, Inez? Yeah. She's over there laughing. She knows me too well. Are you ready for deliverance? Are you sure? All right, here we go. You ready? Isn't God good? little blood coming out of there little blood I know I'm strong I know that I am strong I know I know I shout I know I scream but I know what I know but I know what I know all right here we go almost done idols don't leave on their own I need to say that again. Idols do not leave on their own. In the power of the gospel, we have to tear them down. We have to destroy them. We have to freely give them away and crush them. We need to remove them from our lives and depart from them. Oh, they'll call you back. They'll call you back. They want you back. So the question we must ask ourselves, everyone should ask themselves, everyone watching me needs to ask themselves is this, should I put anything before God? 
How about your career? How about wealth? If you put wealth in your career, how about fear? How about hatred? Anybody like a good juicy story from time to time, huh? How about gossip? How about unforgiveness? It's called idolatry in the purest form. There shall be no other gods before thee. Not a video game, not a TV program, a cell phone, a person, a thing, nothing. So Pastor Mike, how do I know if I have an idol in my life? Just like Jesus told the rich young man. You'll know depending on how freely you're willing to give it away. You've got to be willing to say, in the name of Jesus, I choose freely to tear down my idols in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I tear down those idols in my life because you, Lord, are my true monarch in life. I give you the praise. I give you the glory. And I give you the honor. In Jesus' name. Please go without giving the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Please feel free to contact us at www.spiritlifeworshipchurch.com. Our phone number is 386-586-2202. And our service begins 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Can't wait to see you guys. God bless.